I'd like to welcome Roger Pedersen to CGE. Mr. Pedersen has been involved in programming, designing, producing games since the early 80s. He's been heavily involved in the TV-based games from uh, Game Tech, and he's here today to talk about how to break into the gaming industry. Thank you. Yeah, I've, uh, over the last few years, I've taught at colleges like NYU and helped uh, SMU in uh, Texas, I uh, did some stuff with Full Sail as well as a college in New Jersey where both uh, guys that just spoke and myself are from uh, Bloomfield College. And uh, I mean, I wrote a book, it's uh, on game design, uh, teaching people how to make games. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, there were two people who were writing books on game design. One were programmers and one were artists. As we all know, game design is its own uh, series of skills, so I wanted to write something from that point of view. And uh, currently my book is used by over 100 colleges, uh, and I teach, as I said, at various colleges on game design. Uh, now, many colleges have really started game design, even your standard uh, computer science degree or your art degree, they were finding that they weren't getting enough students, so if they added like two or three game courses, it would actually increase the number of students in their curriculum. I actually helped a college in New York called uh, Gibbs College, uh, a Globe Institute, where they weren't getting enough students, so we added like four classes that were standard art classes, standard computer science classes. And just by adding a few things to the graphics, you made it game graphics. They increased the number of students. Uh, even for some of the older generation, I went uh, to UAT, University of Advancing Technology. It's on the internet. It's located in uh, Arizona. And I got my MBA in video game production uh, for two reasons. One was, of course, in the regular world, an MBA and a master's looks good. And two is, even today, if you teach at a two-year college, they really want you to have a master's. Uh, in my book, uh, I write, I, I can't go anywhere, and I'm sure most of you, you can't go anywhere without somebody playing a game, whether it's on a bus, a train. They say to you, what do you do? They say, I'm a, uh, I work in the video game business, or I love video games. That's like the biggest conversation starter these days. When I was growing up, it was probably TV shows, but today it's all about, you know, games. Uh, uh, recently, they did a poll of students, and they said, what is your dream job? And believe it or not, the number one dream job was to make ice cream. <laughs> the second job, of course, was to be a game designer, and further down the list was things like fashion designer and also movie director or producer. So probably one of the first times something beat being a, in the film industry. Uh, and that's kind of exciting to me is, uh, you know, kids are growing up these days not only playing games, but saying, hey, we want to be part of this business. Uh, one of the recent gaming uh, uh, survey and research groups said that by the year 2015, this will be like a $90 billion business. And uh, so... You can see that, you know, you can't go anywhere without something about games being involved. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, the classes that I helped start at NYU, I usually look at the makeup of the school to figure out, uh, you know, what is the driving force for a gaming class. Originally, about maybe five, six years ago, someone at Bloomfield College said, hey, I'd like to do something with gaming. And so we put together a curriculum where we had an art track, we had a game uh, programming track, and then we kind of brought the students together for the first semester. They would work together on a project, and then they go their separate ways to learn skills, and then they come back for their senior uh, uh, project, and they would work together on uh, an actual game that they could then take to an employer and say, here's a game I went, you know, and this is what I did as far as the game. Um, and uh, as I said, the first year, there was maybe a, a dozen students. Currently today, there's like over 300 students. 
and there's so many that they, the school itself doesn't have enough room. Uh, one of the things that they have there is a very professional sound studio. And even though, you know, two semesters of sound I wasn't really in agreement with, because the school invested millions of dollars in this sound studio, they make all the students take two semesters of uh, audio. But uh, at NYU, we did something similar. We had a certain amount of art courses where even myself, I'm not an artist, you wouldn't want to buy stuff that I did the artwork in unless it was the old 8-bit stuff where if I made it look like a character, everybody was happy. But uh, even at NYU, they take uh, classes in using some of the uh, uh, art tools like Maya and uh, 3D Studio Max just to put some shapes together. And then they take a scripting class and, of course, programming and game design. But, uh, you know, generally I go around and I talk to a lot of kids. I see them on, uh, as I said, you know, when I'm on a bus or a train. And everyone says the same thing. I always say, you know, what game do you want to make? And they go, oh, I have so many ideas. I just played, uh, you know, this one game. And, you know, I wish it had these features. Uh, I was talking to a kid the other day, and he's like, the first version of XYZ game had this, this, and this. And the second version, they like forgot about that. And those are the three elements that they really liked. So, you know, you start thinking about, you know, what, what kind of game you want to make. And in my book, I basically describe that a game designer basically puts the documentation together, figures out what are the really cool things, the mechanics in the game, what makes this game better. And so, uh, through, you know, reading my, one of the things I wanted to put together in my book was that, you know, by the end of the book, you should have enough information to show somebody and say, here's the game I want to make, here's all the information. And uh, the uh, colleges out there, one of the top colleges is in uh, Canada and Washington, which is DigiPen. DigiPen is very closely tied to Nintendo so that a lot of the graduates go there. But also look at some of the hotbeds, like Boston is a big hotbed these days for gaming. So you got MIT, uh, they're one of the top gaming schools as far as teaching game design and programming. Uh, another hotbed is Texas, that's where SMU is, which I said earlier, Southwest uh, Methodist. Um, you got uh, colleges, uh, um, you know, in California, you got UCLA, USC, which has very strong gaming uh, uh, programming, as well as art, as well as game design. Um, and uh, looking around the audience, uh, we've got uh, from kids to adults, uh, uh, has anyone uh, has anyone got a degree or in, into programming? Okay, I mean, there's a lot of online colleges, as I said, UAT uh, is one of them, uh, Westwood College, uh, a couple of colleges where you can be online and get your advanced degree in either programming or art or game design. Uh, as I said, uh, I decided to go to UAT. Um, I also took some classes at DeVry. DeVry is also located on the internet as well as in many, many states. Um, and uh, that's, you know, one of the keys, of course, is to find out where the graduates are. I mean, UAT, uh, SMU, I've talked to, Full Sail. If you get on LinkedIn or Facebook, they have very large presence on these uh, uh, social websites. And, you know, one of the things is to find out from the graduates where they currently are. Um, I've also gone into high schools and uh, presented to high schools uh, you know, where are the colleges? So one of the uh, best websites for looking up colleges and seeing what they offer is called GameCareerGuide.com. And uh, the other sites I get on, I don't know how many people get on Gamasutra.com, G-A-M-A-S-U-T-R-A, Gamasutra.com, but it's a website that I'm on pretty much every day, if not two, three times a week, and it's all the latest information in gaming. And another site that a friend of mine is uh, uh, works with is called GameDev.net. 
It's another site uh, that uh, features a lot of good information about uh, gaming. And uh, in uh, preparing for the talk, I uh, wrote down a few things. Uh, you know, if you're really interested in gaming, uh, besides classic games, uh, I would uh, look up on the IGDA.org, that stands for the International Game Developers Association, and uh, find out where the local chapter is. We have uh, several chapters I belong to. I belong to one in New York City. I belong to one in New Jersey, where I'm from. And then sometimes I go as far as Philadelphia, Boston, or upstate New York, Albany, and I meet with them uh, to find out uh, you know, what they're working on uh, Boston's uh, set a very big uh, bed for uh, for ga for gaming, and uh, and then the big conference every year is called the Game Developers Conference, which is gdconf.com. And it's kind of like this conference where uh, you know people that are in the game industry uh, talk about their projects, from uh, you know guys like Will Wright to. Uh, uh, you know, Peter Molinet, uh, so you get the really, you know, insight as to, you know, how they made their games and uh, obviously more recent games than the classic gaming. I mean, when I started, uh, I started in high school and I was making board games. Uh, I'm one of the kind of guys that, I didn't like to do reports, I don't know how many people enjoy doing reports, but that was the thing that I, you know, like we were doing a report on, uh, you know, say the Odyssey. I said, oh, I don't want to do a report on that. So I built a board game of all the characters in the Odyssey. And I had them, you know, running around and battling each other. And then a company in uh, Baltimore, Avalon Hill, said, hey, you want to buy your games? And I would sell it to them. And then later on, when I was 12 years old, I got involved in my computer. Uh, in the high school, in junior high school, we had computers. I got started getting involved in that, and I basically taught myself uh, how to make, uh, you know, what was in those days, computer games. I mean, uh, they were uh, very, uh, they were pre-1980, so. Uh, but nowadays, uh, as I said, uh, it's really important to train uh, and to learn uh, certain skills. Uh, I was interviewed by uh, Columbia University uh, in uh, I basically, my belief is, and I say this at all my talks about education, is get a solid degree. I mean, I hate to see someone go and say, I'm a video game designer, and then, of course, there's layoffs, or so they get fed up with the business, and then they go to some bank or brokerage company and say, well, I got my degree in video game design. Uh, what can I do with your <laughs> in your company? Uh, so if you're an artist... You can do artwork for movies, you can do artwork for websites, you can do artwork for advertising companies, a solid art degree. I mean, I was at a uh, show in uh, Philadelphia for gaming, and between the show and the after party, I went to, to a place to get a hamburger, and I'm sitting next to a guy from Savannah College, of, uh, or art, art college, uh, and uh, he said, he turned to me and he goes, uh, we're using your book in our classes. So I said, oh, I, I didn't, I'm just here to have a hamburger. And I was surprised that somebody, uh, you know, picked me out of a crowd. But uh, there's some very good schools uh, like that where, uh, you know, where they're uh, uh, artists. So get a solid art degree, get a solid programming degree. Uh, I've done over a hundred video games or computer games as far as programming and designing. Uh, when I was at a company called Acclaim, probably a couple people have heard of Acclaim, uh, I, uh, I was the game designer and the uh, executive producer, but many, many times I would be working with some programmer in, say, Germany, uh, and he'd say, I have a bug, and nobody could find it, and I'd have to actually go into the uh, testing area, and you know, even though I was quote a producer or a game designer, and I actually go and look at the code and understand what what some of the problems were. So it's always uh, helped in those respects. And then, you know, if, a lot of times in the gaming industry, uh, you know, you're working, especially when the game's about to be shipped, you know, 
course, we can't change Christmas, so your game for Christmas is usually try to be finished around uh, August, September, and you're putting in, you know, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, because you're trying to make sure everything, all the bugs are found and the game's ready to go. And oftentimes, especially on some big projects, like I've read uh, stories like from uh, some people on Madden and some of these really big titles, you get burned out. It's always good to then say, yeah, maybe I'll take six months and I'll work for a company as a programmer, or work six months for a company as an artist, and then come back to the gaming uh, thing. Uh, currently, uh, I'm looking at, uh, I was reading some of the information from uh, Facebook, of all the Facebook uh, and social games. So my current thing right now is I'm putting together a uh, Flash game for Facebook. But uh, I've also worked for you know very big companies. As I said, I worked for Game Tech. I did all of their titles, uh, all their game shows, uh, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, Price is Right, uh, Hollywood Squares, Pressure Luck. Uh, I did their uh, Fisher Price titles, uh, Perfect Fit. Uh, I can remember some of these were for the NES, some for uh, Apple, the Commodore, the uh, IBM. Um, I did uh, work for uh, High Tech Expressions, uh, Merit uh, Software, I did a title for them called All Dogs Go to Heaven, both the Amiga and the IBM version. And, uh, you know, kind of in the old days you learned everything on your own. You know, there wasn't any schools, it wasn't, uh, I mean, I did learn programming in, you know, junior high, high school, and I picked it up. Uh, and. Uh, in recent years, I picked up some of these art packages, not because I'm an artist, but when I want to communicate with an artist, I can say, you know what, I want to use the hair and clothing effects for Maya, and I want to do this in 3D Studio Max, and uh, maybe use soft homage to do uh, some other, uh, you know, work. And so it's always good to know the packages. And uh, But also, I always, one of the things I make my students do is, uh, I go to this one site, it's, uh, it's an internet site with all the old games. I'm trying to remember, was it Nam something? Uh, maybe some of you have been on it. It's, it's all the old games, Burger Time, uh, Pac-Man, Asteroids. And I make my students that have been playing, you know, World of Warcraft and Modern Warfare 3, I make them play these old, old games. Why? Because we didn't have sophisticated graphics, we had to rely on gameplay to really make our games, you know, fun and addictive. And uh, we didn't have all the sound and all the wonderful graphics. And I say, that's what really makes a game. You know, you want to capture somebody. I mean, you think about some of these things, you know, we had, uh, in the old days, vector graphics, black and white, or when I worked on the IBM, we only had four colors when it first came out. And uh, even when I dithered, I used to say, oh, I have 32 colors because I'm dithering the different patterns. And, uh, but we really only had four colors. And uh, remember when I was at RIT, we had like two and 4K machines. You know, the old uh, Heath, uh, the, you know, the Heath uh, kit uh, machines and other ones. And, you know, today, uh, you know, I work, even when I work at banks and brokerage firms, and someone goes, I want two gigs of memory. I'm like, you could do this in like, you know, 1K. I mean, <laughs> you know, why waste all that space? And, uh, so some of these techniques that we use, uh, you know, in the old days are really relevant, even though you have so much space and everything else. You know, it's like I always say to students, you know, why are you thinking so big when you can just make it real small, fast, compact. And so a lot of these rules, I remember uh, I did two games for the uh, Nintendo DS. Anyone have a DS uh, or worked on them? The DS, uh, when I first, I did Cake Mania and I did Mad Libs for the DS. I never worked on a DS. I remember my uh, 6502 assembler and, and this was uh, 68,000 and uh, we were able to use uh, C++ for the uh, for these uh, DS games, but you know, I'm looking at it, and I had all these college graduates from Full Sail and other colleges, and uh, they're like, 
how do we do this? There's no font set. There's nothing in this machine. I'm like, this is like going back to 1980. I have to like make my own fonts and my own graphic routines. And it was like, uh, even though it was a modern machine with some really fast, you know, real fast CPU, real fast graphics, it was 30, you know, like say 32 bit color and everything else. And, you know, but the actual programming and the core of the machine was like me going back to 1980, where I had to then, you know, put in all of these very low-level routines to handle graphics and uh, handle sound. So it was very interesting. Um, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? As far as uh, you know, has anyone thought about? The, I see some older people and some, some young, younger uh, uh, people. Uh, Anyone have, has anyone thought about maybe going online to some of these schools? I know DeRoy has a really good program that I've gone through. Uh, UAT, Westwood uh, College, I've talked to them. Uh, uh, there's a lot of really strong uh, programs out there. And, uh, you know, to me, I was talking to someone uh, last night and he was saying, you know, I've been working in the business for, you know, 20 years but he only had his bachelor's degree. And uh, when I went first to NYU, they said I you know, needed a master's, but they were willing to take me because I had written this book and I actually helped them set up the curriculum. So, uh, but uh, you know, as, as colleges are starting to uh, you know, look for gaming people, they really want an advanced degree, like a master's. So, Any, uh, what, there's a question. What, what's the hardest machine you've ever worked on? Hardest to program, and um, why? Well, I was working for a company uh, in uh, outside Philadelphia, and there was a new machine that had just come out called the Atari Jaguar. And they said, we're going to send you to Atari school in California. <coughs> and they said, Atari has a new C++ compiler that you'll be able to use. So. When I interviewed, I said, I'm really strong at C and C++. Uh, and we went, flew out to California, myself and one other guy. And Atari says, oh, that compiler won't be available for two years. <laughs> I said, you got to program in Risk Assembler in 68,000. So I went back home and I said, you know, I've never, I programmed the 6502, but I've never done 68,000. I have no idea what this risk thing is about. And so uh, I figured I'd uh, write something on the PC in C, C++. I get it up to up and running because we were connecting from the PC to the Jaguar. And then I said, OK, let me rewrite this routine in 68,000 Assembler. And within about two weeks, I had that up and running. Then I said, well, let me try some of these graphic routines and write them for the RISC system. And I got that eventually running. And so I uh, was very excited about uh, that. It was uh, difficult because, again, uh, you know, the documentation and uh, and at the time, I don't know if anyone's gone to a uh, like a restaurant or a bar. There's something called a mega touch in a lot of these venues, and that was the system that I was working on. And uh, we did the original uh, mega touch. It used the Z80 chip. If anyone remembers that, in fact. Uh, I was in uh, outside uh, uh, Boston area working for a company, and down the hallway from us, a, a little sign on the door said Zilog. I said it couldn't be, so I knocked on the door one day, and sure enough, this little office <laughs> was the guys who did the Z80 chip. I guess they had moved there, but uh, uh, but at some point, uh, the company decided that the Z80 chip wasn't going to be around for too long, and they wanted to make better better games. So I originally went to the Atari Jaguar, and uh, a lot of times in our history of uh, sometimes the really great systems fall by the wayside, and the other systems, uh, you know, come about. Uh, as an example, you know, I mean, you know, the Apple II I really loved, and then the Macintosh came out, and it wasn't compatible, and I'm like, well, what's, <laughs> you know, what's happening? such a great system. The uh, Amiga had great graphics and sound. It fell by the wayside. I do things with film. And the beta, you know, if you go to a professional film place, they use beta 
whereas VHS took over. So a lot of times, uh, especially in my career, uh, sometimes the really great items uh, fall by the wayside. And that's what happened with the Jaguar. It was It never really took off, and then eventually uh, the software that I wrote had to be put on Windows PC, and now all the new machines for uh, Merit Industries, called the Mega Touch, is all on PC. But uh, yeah, that was probably one of the hardest, and of course, uh, when I was doing the Nintendo DS, the company I did it for was kind of a startup. And originally they came to me and said, we have two great games. We could do either this great movie coming out with Jack Black, or we could do Cake Mania. And I said, well, Cake Mania is this really great internet game. And it's your first game you're doing, so why don't you do that? Unfortunately, and I don't know why, but a lot of times a game that's based on a movie, if the movie like stinks, nobody buys the game, and the game could be really great. And the movie that came out was called Nacho Libre, which we know how what a big hit that was. Uh, that you know nobody went to that movie, and so uh, somebody else did the uh, uh, DS version of that, and of course that didn't sell at all. And uh, and so uh, we did it for. And anyway, part of this. Uh, working for this company was that they had just gotten in a Wii system, which which was brand new, and I started programming some stuff on the Wii for, on the side, and I uh, got to see what a great great machine that was. But uh, yeah, each machine, you know, if you work on one machine, especially in the older days, uh, all these new machines, it's, it's like you know, oh, I had to do all this work, and now it's handled for me. Um, so. That's 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 the one. Thing. Okay. So when you teach your uh, classes, what kind of uh, assignments do you give to your students in game design? Okay. The question is, what kind of when I teach students, what do I basically give them as like homework and assignments? Uh, it varies. Uh, in my in my first book, this is the second edition. The first book, I said, you know, I wanted something that could be sold at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I didn't want like a really textbook. So I kind of put stuff together in my first book, and one of my uh, thoughts was I'd talk about products that were available right now, and then two years later I would update those chapters. Well, it turned out that the stuff that wasn't about product, people really liked, and the product part they didn't like. So I said, well, I want to rewrite the book and get rid of all that product stuff and put in more really solid information. So I talk about uh, one of the chapters about you know, what are the top games of these particular years? And then, you know, play the games and explain why they were big hits. Uh, looking at different uh, uh, positions in the gaming industry, you know. I'm a programmer, but understanding what an artist does or understanding what an audio guy does. Uh, look at the top companies. One of the things I stress to students, whether they're high school students or college students is, you want a game? You want a job in the game industry? Play a game and write a letter to the publisher, not the pub, the president. You write it to the producer of that particular game, because the president of the company gets his mail screened. The the producer of the game, who has some say in all the future games, nobody cares about uh, about them. One of the things I like to do. Is I'll be playing a game and at like you know three o'clock in the morning I'm stuck on something. What do I do if I'm stuck? I look at who the programmer was in the credits. And I call him up the next day and I say, Bob, you were the programmer on this game. He goes, Yes, I was. You did a phenomenal job. I love this thing. Let me tell you something. I'm on level 15 and I'm stuck. What do I do? He will spend two hours with me on the phone because nobody cares about Bob in the programming area. He will spend two hours telling me how to get through all these hard sections and uh, I get through the game. So those are the kinds of things. But I tell my students I have them go to E3. Who's at E3? It's not the programmers. It's not the artists. It's the producers. They're sitting there showing off their latest game. And I've had students of mine at NYU and... Uh, Bloomfield College, go up to the producers and saying, hey, I just played this game, or I just saw a demo, you know, if it's one coming out. 
this is the third game in a series. Is it going to have the same as your first two? And, you know, here's my car. Here's, you know, I'm graduating from this school. And they've gotten jobs with these companies because they showed interest in their properties. Now, if I'm doing a game and you come to me and say, hey, I'd like to work for you, and I go, well, did you play any of my other games? And you go, I have no idea what you've ever done. That's not going to, like, excite me into hiring you. But if you say, well, I've played, you know, three of your games and I really like these elements, now I'm like, well, you know, you really understand where, where I'm coming from. And that's what happens in the game industry. You know, a lot of testers, you know, no one's going to hire you to be a game designer unless you have experience. And all these college kids, like, oh, I want to be a game designer. Well, you got to kind of get to that position. So a lot of people go through testing. If you write a letter saying, you know, I just played your game and I really like these elements, but these elements, you know, I think you missed the mark. I would have done it this way. Those are the guys that say, wow, you know, this guy really understands the game. When I was at a claim, I had testers who would come to me and say, I really love martial arts games. I'm like, well, I'm working on this game called Mortal Kombat, or I'm working on Psychic Force. They would say, well, I want to be part of that testing team. And those testers were really top of top because they were really interested and uh, we put out a really good product. And so that's that's what you look for. Um, but uh, yeah, in, the, in my uh, teaching, as I said, I try to teach them old, old classic games. I try to teach them uh, how to write. If you have, uh, you know, Students that, uh, you know, understand, uh, like if you read, like, say, The Odyssey, I always tell my students, you know, one of the great things in the book, The Odyssey, is when uh, Ulysses fights the Cyclops, and the Cyclops, you know, gets blinded, and he says, who did this to me? And he says, I'm no man. And uh, Later on, when the Cyclops talks to the gods, they say, who blinded you? And he says, no man. And they say, well, if it was no man, it must have been one of the other gods, and we don't want to fool around with another god. Well, if you don't know stories like that, then how do you make a game where you can put in something relevant like that? Um, or if you don't know gaming history, you know, maybe... I like to, a lot of my games, pay homage to, like, movies or other games, so I'll put in an Easter egg that's like, you know, here's something, and you go, oh, wow, that was in a game that I played years ago. So if you know that kind of, uh, you know, from literature to, uh, to other games. I did a game, as I said earlier, All Dogs Go to Heaven. I had one uh, scenario that was basically, uh, you know, Pac-Man type game, and another scenario that was uh, like a pong. You had two characters and a ball. It actually was a watch, because in the movie a watch is very significant. You're banging the watch playing a pong type game. I had another scenario where they had to escape from a, from a basement. So I did the Towers of Hanoi uh, puzzle where you have five different uh, layers from small to large. and You have to put them in order and so you had these uh, five layers in the middle of the uh, basement. You had to move them back and forth so that you, you ended up with these five layers next to the window and then the main character climbed out the window. So by knowing you know, some of these classic games uh, is a big help. I was at a company you might have heard of called Sony, right? And they wanted to hire me as head of their uh, you know, gaming area for classic games like chess and backgammon. So I met with about 20 people that I'd be working with, and I asked them, I said, how many people play poker? Nobody raised their hand. How many people play chess? I'm a chess master. Nobody raised their hand. I also wrote a poker game called uh, uh, Real Deal Poker, uh, which is an adventure slash poker game. So even though I'm not a, you know, I don't play poker a lot, I just understand the game. Anyway, I went through a bunch of standard games that people would play, from backgammon, checkers, and nobody in the 20-person group had played any of these games outside the office. And my comment was, how are you guys going to know what your 
you know, what your consumers and buyers are going to want in the game if you don't play these games. And so that's some of the things I try to instill on my, uh, on my students. I actually teach them the game Magic because there's so many elements in Magic. I don't know how many people have ever played Magic or know it. There's so many elements in that game that are significant. I mean, I think the marketing part is genius. Uh, that's what I'm doing in my latest Flash game. My, my game for Facebook is going to be free. And if you want to be, you know, better than anybody else, you'll buy, uh, you'll, you'll pay 99 cents to buy little elements. And I think that's the genius of the whole marketing of, of Magic is that, you know, we can all buy the standard deck, but if you buy the next highest deck, you're a little bit better player. If you buy the, you know, premium deck, you're, you're, you're even a better player. And then you have, you know, so, you know, you know, have so many different colors to choose from. And in a good magic deck, I think you're supposed to use like two colors, right? Those concentrate on two of, say, the eight or whatever colors there are. So that, you know, if you're a game designer, if you think about these elements, I teach them backgammon. I teach them chess, um, uh, Othello. These are standard games. Uh, I was reading an article because I'm a chess player. How many games have lasted over 2,000 years? You know, we talk about video games and we talk about the classics. When, you know, let's say the classics came out in 1970. So what is it? 40 years of classic, game, you know, video games. Where, you know, where are they going to be in, you know, a thousand years? And some of these really standard games have been around for, you know, thousands of years, like chess, checkers. Uh, so. Uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I try to instill on uh, the students, is to understand, you know, games outside of the television screen. Um, anybody else? Uh, anything? Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who wants to start their own video game company? Start their own video game company? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I've started my own video game company, hence my shirt back in... Uh, 1980s. Uh, in the early 80s, as I said, I worked for Game Tech. I used to walk into a, comp a little store called Toys R Us. I'd walk in there, and I have pictures where from floor to ceiling, and you've probably seen Toys R Us, their ceilings are pretty high, for like 80 feet across was all my Game Tech games. And uh, I, uh, Game Tech, when they got into Nintendo, uh, they were our games got to put on Nintendo too. They were making a lot of money. And so after that endeavor, I foolishly said, boy, if I made them a lot of money, I could do it on my own. And I found that as a game designer, as a programmer, that's where my love was. As a business person, that wasn't me at the time. And I tried to run my business from 9 o'clock till 3 o'clock where I wore my business hat. From 3 o'clock till midnight or later, I did my development. And that's how I split my day. Uh, I found out very quickly that, that the business side wasn't me. Then I joined a company called Villa Crespo. We did gambling games. Uh, we did uh, Flicks, which was a, uh, uh, a film review library. Uh, and I got a little inventive and I did something. My boss came to me one day and he said, I have two problems. One is, I want to outsell my first year, the second year. And two is, um, we had these uh, companies that were doing uh, shareware at the time. If you remember, there's a shareware. And they were like, you know, publishers are screwing us. We don't want to work with them. So we had these two issues. And I came up with something the first time in the industry called the Coffee Break Series. I don't know if anyone's heard of those. But we decided to do... Uh, put numbers on all the coffee break series because I figured people are going to say, "Oh, I have you know number 13. I want the first 12." And two, this was uh, $13 software, and nobody in the industry had ever done software so cheap. And we decided that we would put them in the used bin pile, and people would buy these for $13. And uh, anyway, we had the both. We would then I took my video poker game, which was $50, and I abridged it for $13, very, you know, 
and then we took the shareware and put them in there. So uh, I decided that I would let the guy from Villa Crespo run the business side and I would do the development and we share in the money. But as far as starting your own company, the first thing I would do is to make sure that, you know, what, what niche are you going to do? I'm doing, you know, I'm back doing my own company again and I decided I want to design the game and put it on Facebook because the latest numbers on Facebook are incredible as far as how many millions of people are playing social games. I have other friends of mine that are doing, you know, iPod games, they're doing cell phone games. Those kind of games don't require big company money. I mean, I'm financing this myself, and believe me, <laughs> you know, um, I'm nowhere near that. So I would look at what what is your niche. You can do a cell phone game. Believe me, if you did a cell phone game like Angry Birds and it got hot, they're going to put you on every platform there is. You're going to find financing somewhere. The talk just before me, I don't know how many people heard uh, the talk about uh, uh, was it David uh, Crane? Uh, he's he's financing through uh, through the websites Kickstart and. Uh, you know, so there's the, in the group that did Angry Birds, they actually, it's kind of humorous that they had uh, uh, one of the cell phone companies had a contest and they won the contest. And last year they made as much money and profit as the company who sponsored their original, <laughs> their original yeah. contest. So I have to find a niche that, that you have. And then I look at your strengths. Um, I know my strength is in, you know, design and programming. I'm not an artist. Uh, one of the things I did early on, about maybe 10 years ago, uh, was uh, I put ads on sites like Gamma Sutra and other places where you can find programmers and artists. And I said, you know, here's my budget. I have $10,000 for all this artwork. That's it. And uh, I had to go through a lot of emails from companies, especially in the US, who wanted like $100,000. I said my budget's ten. That's what I said, you know. So I you have to ignore the high end. And then I found artists in China, India, Indonesia, who are very happy to take ten thousand dollars for a lot. And I, you know, so I have my latest project that I'm doing for Facebook. I have ten artists in Indonesia, and so far my budget is two thousand dollars, and I've already gotten probably, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of US artwork, you know, that I would get charged here. So look at, you know, what your strength is, uh, what kind of game you want to make. Uh, I, I wouldn't make a, you know, uh, Xbox or Wii game because that would be out of my budget. Uh, but I know that if my game's successful, it could be, you know, put on those platforms. Somebody will pay me to do that. Um, and then, you know, find yourself a good group of people to work with you. You know, I know I'm not an artist, you know, but I found artists, as I said, outside the U.S. who have, you know, given me, you know, very good work. How I work with artists, I don't say, uh, you know, draw me such and such. I need a character in my game, draw it for me. I'll go, here's a picture of Nicolas Cage. Here's a couple, of, you know, things that I like. And then I say, you know, Draw me a character similar to that. Or I'm doing an Indiana Jones type game. Here's some samples of Harrison Ford. You know, give them some direction. And uh, same thing with music. You know, one of my friends is going to be speaking on music, Tommy Tallarico. And I would say that you know, a musician. Here's the kind of music I like. It's you know, it's it's going to be like a Pirates of the Caribbean game, and I want some kind of music that's you know, Caribbean style. And I'll give them some examples. Because that saves me money. You say, draw me something or give me music. You're giving them such a large range that they're going to give you like, you know, 30 pieces that you don't even want, and then they're going to want money for it. So I try to like narrow them down. I'll say to my artist, I say, don't give me the full animation. Show me some sketches. I did a game that's still in progress called uh, it's an Alice in Wonderland based game, and I said, draw me the characters, and they drew me all the characters. And then I said, okay, I like these, I don't like that. Went back and forth for about two months. But I had static images of my characters. And now that I liked the way they looked, 
Then I said, okay, now you can animate those characters. So if you, the more defined you have for your game, uh, the better I found. And those are some of the ideas that uh, you know hopefully will help you. Anybody else? Yep. So you just mentioned <clears throat> outsourcing as as a way that you can save costs. Do you think that your specific job is threatened by outsourcing too, or what are you doing that couldn't be done in Indonesia or China either? Okay. A lot of computer companies I've talked to, especially in gaming, the actual programming is done in-house. Even like companies like banks and brokerage firms that I've worked for that outsource to India, a lot of their you know main core uh, work is done here in the States. Uh, a, because it gives them more control, and B, they don't want the thing to be sold six months later to their competitors. I try to outsource things that I know I can't do, and you know, what are they going to do with it? So like artwork, as soon as I get those images of the artwork with the static pictures, I go to the U.S., uh, I go in the U.S., uh, it's called USPTO, Patent and Trademark Office, and I trademark all of the artwork the artist has given me. So the artist decides six months later to take that artwork and do something with it. I say, excuse me, I have a, you know, patent, I have a trademark on that. I also trademark all of my names in my games. It's 300 bucks, but it's really worth it. Um, my latest game, I think, is uh, the title is phenomenal, and I didn't want to like tell anybody until I got the trademark. It's uh, it's going to be a game I think will be tailored for uh, college students as well as what they call the casual gamer, which is women uh, 40 to 55. It's going to teach people how to make drinks. Now, what college student doesn't want to know how to make a drink, number one? And for housewives, I have a whole thing, and one of the things you can buy from my collection is called uh, holiday drinks. So if you're entertaining from Thanksgiving to Christmas and <clears throat> want to know the latest drinks, you can buy for 99 cents all the latest drinks that I found on the Internet. So, uh, so I, you know... I, find, I try to find what, what can I protect myself with. The programming, I'll do. And I have a, a partner of mine, we both do flash programming, as well as uh, you know, other types. But for Facebook, I figure I'll just throw something together. And that way, I'm not tied to Facebook, any site that has flash. But uh, yeah, artwork and music I outsource. Um, and. Uh, and the reason is that my budgets aren't that big. I mean, I worked for a claim where I had, you know, you know, 200 artists working on a project and a whole sound studio. And so, but as I said, look at uh, my budget. Yeah. If you were going to just uh, make a game as a hobby, a small game, what tools would you recommend to use to you know build up bad habits? Okay, one of the things I taught at Bloomfield College uh, that they were lacking was I taught 3D programming. And originally, we used the Torque engine, T-O-R-Q-U-E. It was $300 for the school. I figured they could afford $300. And as I taught the first semester, right in this, uh, this, the second semester I was teaching, all of a sudden, Epic Games got really smart and decided, hey, we don't have to, uh, it used to be 50,000 to 100,000 plus just to uh, have the Unreal Engine. And then Tor came out and said, hey, we're going to give the Unreal Engine away for free. And then if you make money, you make over like, I don't know, $100,000 in sales, then you come and talk to us because we want some money. So then we started teaching the, uh, the Unreal Engine. So if I was making a 3D game, I would look at, you know, what's out there for that. As far as non-3D, if I want to do something, I would look at Flash, which is... I always call it the uh, programming language for artists because it's fairly, uh, you know, simple to use. Um, I would look at, uh, if I was doing something for the cell phones or something, I'd look at things like Unity. Uh, a lot of my friends have uh, tools for the uh, iPhone and I, uh, iPad, a lot of good tools out there. Um, but uh, what I would first do is I would actually start with very simple put together a game design. You know, I always say to my students, the first thing they do is they, in one sentence, they explain to me what their game is, in one sentence. 
you know. Uh, and then from there, they then, you know, make it even more. They, they do what they call a one-pager. One page, tell me why this game is similar to other products, because if it's so unique, you know, it's going to be hard to sell. So why is it similar, but then why is it different? Uh, where do you see this product going on? I mean, a lot of students go, I want to put this on the Xbox, and I'm going to do it on my own. Well, maybe that's not the first platform. Maybe you should do something a little bit, uh, you know, like the Internet. If it works on the Internet, then go uh, to a bigger machine, you know, something that's going to cost more and have budgets, because unless you're advertising in every magazine and on the, you know, on the TV, it's going to be hard to sell. So I would like pick out what you want to do and start, you know, especially like the guy up here was talking about his own uh, company. Find something. I mean, there's, we've come around a full circle. We've gone from like home computers and it was very easy to use. I was doing all my uh, Apple games and NES games at home. And then all of a sudden we have these you know, huge budgets and you have to be part of a team and in a company. That's why I joined Acclaim. And now we come back to, you know, we now have, you know, the DS, which is uh, fairly easy to uh, program. We have the cell phones. We have the internet. Um, a lot of companies are doing digital distribution because why, you know, why be in some of these stores? Uh, we did something <clears throat> when I was at Villa Crespo. I'm not sure if anyone knows, <clears throat> me, knows this. I mean, it's kind of common in the industry. When I put a product in an electronic boutique, I had to pay for shelf space as a publisher. When Villa Crespo was a publisher that I worked for, I was one of their you know, three employees when we started. We had to pay for our product to be on the shelf. And if we wanted it face out, not spine, but face out, that was literally like $50,000 per store per month. You start figuring out electronic boutique with all their stores. That's expensive. So what we did was uh, we went to a uh, a show, and I don't know if you ever seen some of these uh, shows. They'll have like a little button they give you with a blinking red light. Well, we thought that was pretty interesting. So we decided well, we'll put a blinking red light on our boxes, and we patented that. So we got a U.S. patent on it. And then all the stores said, well, you're not paying the fifty thousand, so we have to put you a spine. Well, that blinking red light in the mall looked like a fire. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, the EB manager had to every morning go to the store to put out the fire, which was our blinking red light. And they were pretty mad about that, so they said, you know what, I'm putting it out, you know, face out. So we were at every single electronic boutique, as well as Comp USA and other stores. And uh, we didn't pay the 50000 because our... <laughs> the manager was so mad that they were <laughs> getting cold at 3 a.m. So, okay, well, I'm told that uh, we're pretty much at the end here. And if anyone wants a copy of my book or my business card, uh, feel free to, to see me. Um, I'll be here today and tomorrow. So, uh, thank you very much for attending.